OK, so we're going to go ahead and get started. If anybody else jumps in, hopefully they get here before the first code word so they don't miss out on their CPE credits. So as you can see from the screen that's on there, the slide that's on the screen, this is the pass through entities session. So if you somehow wanted in the wrong room, now is your chance to escape. Uh, before I begin, I've been asked to read this statement. Sessions will be recorded for future reference. Your participation indicates your consent for your voice or your image to be part of the recording. Please do not disclose any private information during the sessions. Um, doesn't look like it's been put in the chat, but in the other sessions it was in the chat. So um, if it's there, it's there, but now that you've heard it. Um, I believe we do have a few guests here, non-employee, non-handsome legal employees. So if you don't know me, I'm Josh Rifle. I'm a tax supervisor here. I'm going into my ninth tax season now, I think. Ninth, yeah, ninth tax season, so it's been a little while. Uh, for those of you who do know me, well, I'm sorry. Uh, the planners of this event today have deemed it appropriate that we should have a 100 minute session right after lunch. Um, so with that being said, while I have prepared a well informative session, if you have any questions or would like to have a discussion on something, please do so. Um, bringing in discussions or questions should hopefully keep us all awake, myself included. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, but please ask as they arise. Uh, if you don't, then you're either going to forget about it and you're going to be frustrated with yourself or you're going to be so focused on asking your question, remembering you're going to ignore everything else that I say, and that would be kind of rude. Not really, but please ask questions. Uh, feel free to chat it in or use the little hand raise icon. I'm going to keep an eye on that as best I can while I'm going through so I can see that. Um, if you haven't already done so, please open the tax conference, the link on the tax conference website for attendance verification. At seemingly random intervals, magic code words will appear on the screen. There'll be six of them. You'll need all six of these words to unlock the two hour CPE achievement that you'll be awarded at the end of this session. You also have to remain logged in for the full 100 minutes. Failure to do both of these may reduce the CPE awarded, which may result in insufficient CPE for the year, failed CPE audits, loss of CPA license, fatigue, high stroke or deaths. <laughs> Wait, sorry. There's a prescription, dr prescription drug commercial on my other screen. Got a little carried away with the side effects. Unfortunately, bottom line, you need to listen to me ramble on partnerships and, and S corporations for the next one hour and 40 minutes. The great part is we're four minutes in, so only 96% of the way to go. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and move on to our first slide. Okay, an overview of the topics we're going to cover today. We're going to start off with partnerships, talk about basis, debt, distributions, 704C, 754 elections. I've got both 743 and 734 on there. We're going to primarily focus on 743. Um, tax basis reporting. That was a new um, a new requirement last year that came around. We're going to review on that, and I think there's one or two other things that didn't make the bullet point list there. Um, we'll switch over at that point to S corporations. I'll have another slide that shows the various topics we're going to discuss with S corporations as well. Talk a little bit about loss limitations and how they apply at the partner level. It's not necessarily an entity level or a flow through level um, topic, but it, um, it relates to it at least. Uh, we'll look at a few state considerations, not too deep on that. A few of the things that I was going to talk about were covered pretty well in the state and local tax session that we had earlier this morning with Amber and Mark. And then we'll take a little bit of time to look at new re foreign reporting requirements that have been enacted this year. Uh, specifically with schedules K2 and K3 that are now going to be attached to the entity level return and the schedule K1. So we'll look at those towards the end. OK, basis, talking about partnership basis to begin with. So when we're talking about basis in a partnership, what we're talking about is essentially the partner's partner's cost for tax purposes um, in that partnership. It's used for various purposes. Um, ultimately, it would be used for calculating any gain or loss on the disposition or sale of their partnership interest. In the interim, basis is used to determine whether or not uh, losses can be taken by the by the partner, um, whether or not distributions of cash or, of cash are taxable or non-taxable, and it can also affect the basis of any property that's distributed um, to that partner. Now, it's, it's, it's important to note there are two different kinds of basis, outside basis and inside basis. Outside basis is essentially what I just told you. It's the partner's cost in the partnership. 
Um, inside basis is essentially the partnerships uh, adjusted basis in partnership assets. We're not really going to talk too much about that. Most of what we're talking about today when it relates to basis is going to be outside basis. But just note that there are two separate kinds. They can be the same, um, but they might not be depending on various adjustments that may happen throughout the uh, throughout the life of the partnership. Okay, so initial basis. How do you find initial basis? Generally, when a partnership is formed, there are going to be two main methods of, uh, or there are two, two most common methods of forming a partnership, and that's contributions of cash or property by the partnership, or by the partners into the partnership. Cash, most simple uh, example, the basis in cash is the fair market value in cash. Bob and Sally decide to form a partnership and they each contribute $1,000 in cash. Their, their basis is each, is each $1,000, 50-50, if you assume a 50-50 partnership. Very easy. Um, property, right, using the same example before, maybe Bob contributes $1,000 in cash and Sally has a piece of land that she bought for $1,000 at some point. $1,000 doesn't sound like a whole lot of land, but it's what she has. All right. She bought that land for $1,000. That is her basis in the land. And when she contributes it to the partnership, that becomes the her basis in the partnership as well. All right. When it comes to property, the partner's basis becomes their basis in the partnership. Um, there are a few other methods of um, contributing to a partnership, such as provi providing services. We're not going to cover that today. Um, these are kind of the two main or most common methods, at least. Um, all right, and then throughout the life of the partnership, there are going to be adjustments or you know items that affect that tax basis. So, for example, if during the year a partner uh, contributes more cash or additional property that would increase their basis. If they take out cash or property is distributed to them, that decreases their basis. Um, taxable and non-taxable income items, those are also going to increase basis. And then um, deductible and non-deductible expenses, likewise, are going to decrease basis. So it's very important as you're going through doing the, um, you know, doing the work on these entity level returns and representing the information correctly so that the basis you know, the partners can calculate their basis and they know what information to present on their individual and or partner level return, depending on what type of entity they are. OK. We're already to our first code word is basis. Give you a few seconds to go ahead and add that word into your. Verification screen. Basis, first code word. Okay, hopefully we're good. All right, moving on from basis. We're not leaving basis entirely. A lot of what we're going to talk about relates to basis. Um, but we're not going to spend any more time specifically just on basis. We're going to move on to other other areas as well. So debt. With, with regards to partnership, there are three types of partnership debt, two main types and one subtype. You've got recourse and non recourse debt are the two main types of, of liabilities. Recourse debt means that a any partner, a a partner or related persons bears an economic risk of loss and it could be multiple. It could be one or more. Um, but you know, an example would be if a partnership needs to take out a loan and the bank wants somebody to guarantee it, well, maybe one of the partners will go ahead and sign as you know a guarantor on the loan. All right, that makes it recourse to that individual uh, partner. They're at risk of loss. Non-recourse liabilities: no partner or related persons bears risk of loss. That would be things you know. A lot of times, most common examples would be accounts payable, sales tax payable, withhold you know payroll taxes payable. No one specifically is liable for the for for paying them. You know, there's there's no one that's risk of loss for those particular liabilities. Those are called non-recourse. And then you've got qualified non-recourse. Qualified non-recourse debt is debt that is similar to non-recourse in that no one specific or multiple specific partners or related persons bear economic risk of loss for that liability. Um, it's qualified in that it is in connection with the activity of holding real property, real estate. All right, so that makes it qualified recourse. Um, the main difference, aside from you know, the risk of loss between recourse and non-recourse, both types of debt will give basis. 
right? So we're talking about basis before we talked about property and cash. Liabilities will also give basis with regards to each each partner or um, with each partner that's allocated liabilities. Recourse will give what's called at risk basis as well. And what that means is they have an, an, an economic risk of loss. So um, later on, I'm going to talk about loss limitations. We'll see how that comes into play um, as, as we get further along. But just note that liabilities will all give basis, but only recourse will give at risk or economic risk of loss. All right, moving on. When I was talking about activities or events that would affect a partner's basis, I mentioned distributions. Distributions is essentially the partnership distributing something to the partner, generally cash or property, right? Cash distributions, it's exactly the same as when the cash is contributed. The fair market value of the cash that's distributed is the fair market value or the reduction in basis of that partner. So if Bob and Sally form their partnership, they sell widgets for a year, they had each contributed $1,000 initially, partnership made $5,000 during the year, all right, they're split 50-50, so now each partner has a basis of $1,250, all right, partnership distributes $2,500 to each of the partners, reduces their basis back down to their original basis, original, all right. Property distributions. There are two types of property distributions or two methods of calculating property distributions, as it were. Current distribution would basically be a distribution just in the normal course of the partnership's business. All right, the partner's basis in the property is equal to the partnership's basis. It's the exact opposite and essentially the same as a contribution. You know, at the beginning, when I was talking about initial basis, Sally contributed land that was $1,000. That was the basis in the, pro in, in the partnership. Partnership gives that land back to Sally. Partnership's basis was $1,000. Sally's basis is $1,000. And it doesn't have to be land. It could be just depreciable property, machinery, equipment, furniture, et cetera. I'm just using land as an example because there's no depreciation, so it, it keeps things kind of simple. All right? Liquidating distributions. All right? The partner's basis in property equals the partner's remaining basis in the partnership. So if a partner is being liquidated, they're being removed from the partnership or the partnership in general is just being, uh, you know, liquidated, is being, you know, dissolved. If a partner receives a piece of property, say they receive a piece of equipment, a, piece, you know, a machine of some kind. <clears throat> if their basis is $10 in the partnership, then their basis in that property is $10. All right, so after you have to, you have to take into consideration that could lead to some, some gains on the partner side if they decide to sell that property later on. Or it could be losses. If the partner has a million dollars of basis and they get a piece of equipment that's $1,000, well, their basis in the, pro the partnership was a million dollars, so there's their million dollars. Uh, distributions of marketable securities. Marketable securities are treated as cash, generally speaking, so the fair market value of that security is what the basis of, is the basis in the distribution. There are special rules for investment or partnerships classified as investment partnerships, but I'm not going to talk about those because it's a little more advanced than we need to have for this particular presentation. Um, and then debt finance distributions, it's not necessarily a different kind of distribution in terms of cash, property, whatever. Um, basically, de debt finance distribution is a distribution that arises from the acquisition of debt. Um, a common example that I see quite often with some work that I do is um, a um, partnership that owns real estate and they refinance the mortgage on that piece of real estate, you know, say that there's $750,000 left on the mortgage and they decided last year because the mortgage rates were so low, they refinanced and they took out an additional $250,000 and refinanced for a million dollars. They took that $250,000 that was in excess of the original loan that was refinanced, the cash they took out, and they took that cash as a distribution, all right? And actually, I think I have an example on the next slide that's it's exactly that. Well, it's close. Remaining balance was different, but the excess cash was the same, all right? So at the end of the year, 25% of the interest expense from that loan has to be reclassified and separately stated as debt finance interest, interest 
debt finance distribution interest. And the reason for this is that interest could potentially be treated differently. It's not deducted as regular business interest. All right, it depends on how the partner used that distribution. If the partner took that distribution and they used it to invest in another bit, you know, it, 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 they used it in another business they have to start another business, all right, then it could be deducted as business interest. Maybe they took that distribution and they went ahead and bought some type of, type of investment, stocks, um, cryptocurrency, maybe they decided to jump on the whole crypto thing and buy Dogecoin or Shiba Inu um, after it went up 150 million percent in the last year, got on the train a little bit late, all right? That would be considered investment expense and that would be deductible on their Schedule A, subject to investment income limitations, all right? Or maybe they decided to take that distribution and buy a boat, all right? That's a personal expense, it's a non-deductible expense, so in that case, that $250,000 or the interest on that $250,000 portion of the debt is non-deductible to the partner. This is assuming the partner is a uh, individual. All right. So it's very important that you track how distributions are arising. In this, you know, if you have if you have you know uh, partnerships that are doing this type of activity where there's where they're distributing cash from distribution from debt. Okay. Moving on to section 704C. Back at the beginning when I was talking about basis, um, the second point that I raised was contribution of property. You know, in the case of the uh, in case of the example I was using, Sally contributed a piece of land that she bought for a thousand dollars. That became her basis in the partnership. However, maybe she bought that land 30 years ago, back when land was you could buy land for a thousand dollars. All right. And by by now, maybe that land is worth $10,000 has a fair market value of $10,000, all right? That creates what's called a, 704, a deferred 704C gain, all right? She has a pre-contribution gain of $9,000 on that land. If she sold it, she would have gotten $10,000. She would have had a $9,000 gain, all right? That's required to be tracked through the partnership. And the, base, the, the, one, of the one of the main reasons is um, the allocation of pre-contribution gain or loss to contributing partners when the property is sold. So say, for example, Sally went ahead and gave that land to the partnership to form the partnership. And the partnership went ahead and sold it immediately for $10,000. All right, now there's a $9,000 gain in the partnership. Well, say Bob has other businesses on the side, and he's got a whole lot of losses that have been generated over there, all right? Well, maybe in, maybe in the uh, the operating agreement, as part of the operating agreement, they agreed that the partnership would sell the land and the nine thousand dollars would get contributed over to uh, to Bob. You know, he could absorb the loss. There's no taxable gain on it. Well, 704C says you can't do that. All right. I have an example coming up here next, I believe. All right, very similar but lesser numbers. All right. In this case, in the case of this example, all right, we've got a hundred dollars cash from. Um, partner A and Y has land of basis of 50 with fair market value of 100. Okay. If the land is sold for that $100, the $50 tax gain is allocated entirely to Y, the contributing partner. All right. We'll then have $100 of both tax and, tax and book basis. So, um, one of the new requirements last year, in addition to the tax basis reporting, was to report any unrealized, unrecognized 704C gains and losses on the K1 for each particular partner that it applies to. So section 704C will arise when you have contributions of property with difference of basis and fair market value. There are other applications that go into this as well though. For example, oh, I don't have it in there anymore, go back. Um, when it comes to uh, depreciation or expenses that are, um, that arise from that particular piece of property. In this case, it's land, so there's no depreciation. I don't have it in there after that. No, I do. Okay, so we'll go after that. So I was right. All right, second tenant's code word is distribution. I can give you a second to write that into your little tenant's verification. I moved some slides around last night because some of the word, some of these code words were a little bit cluttered together, clustered together. So that's why I was unsure of where I was. All right, we've all gotten the code word written down. Okay, so this is the same 
Same set of circumstances, except the property is now depreciable and not sold immediately. OK, the property is appreciated straight line over five years. Book depreciation is going to be $20, all right, because $100,000 fair market value. But tax depreciation is only 10 because you've got the uh, $50 basis, tax basis. OK, the tax depreciation is going to be allocated to the non-contributing partner to the extent of book depreciation. So eventually, whereas. Go back. In this case. All right. X has $100 of book base of, of tax book and tax basis. Y has $50 of tax basis. All right. If you're allocating the excess distribution to X. As we have here, eventually they're going to have equal tax and book basis between the two of them. Questions on that? Looks like none. OK, a special rule when it comes to seven, Section 704C is called the ceiling rule. Income, gain, loss, and deductions allocated cannot exceed 100% of each item recognized by a partnership. I'll walk through this example here. If you have any questions on it, let me know. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit tricky to follow, but so in this case, A contributes $1,000 in cash. B contributes land with a fair market value of $1,000 and $600 tax basis, using slightly different numbers in the last example. Now, at some point, the land decreases in value to $900 and is sold for that price. Land decreasing in value is rare, but again, non-depreciable, so it makes it easier. The numbers don't change. So now we've got a $100 book loss, okay? The original $1,000 minus the $900 that we've you know, sold it for, but a $300 tax gain. The basis was $600. We sold for $900. Now, an allocation of $350 of gain to B and $50 of loss to A would result in ending book and tax capital of $950. That would make the everything equal as 704C is generally designed to do. However, the tax gain is limited to $300, so you can't do that. All right. In this case, you'd allocate $50 of book loss to each partner and the entire $300 gain to B. At this point, you'd have book and tax capital that are unequal. There are various curative methods that can be used. Um, we're not going to go into those today, but no, just know that there are. Now, generally speaking, you're not going to have a decrease in value of land. Some properties, of course, might. Um, but this was an easy example to look at in terms of e even numbers. Questions on that? OK, sale and exchange of partnerships. OK, so a sale of a partnership interest. Bob and Sally have their business going for a while. Eventually, Bob decides that he's done. He wants to get out and move on. So he's going to sell his 50 percent interest to somebody else. OK, so. First off, when he sells it, he'll have to recognize gain or loss depending on whatever his basis is in the partnership and what he sells it for. OK. Um, the acquiring partner, whoever buys his interest from him, their basis in the partnership is going to be whatever they pay for it. Right. So say they buy his partnership for. Five thousand dollars. Well, now their their basis is five thousand dollars. Inheritance of a partnership, similar-ish. Um, perhaps, perhaps Bob was getting on in years, and he passed away, um, and his partnership was inherited by one of his children. Okay, the basis in that case is going to be the fair market value at the date of death, or alternate uh, elect, elected alternate date of valuation. Um, that gets into the fiduciary world a little bit, which I am not familiar with, um, in terms of how the that elected date works. But that would be the case there. <clears throat> now, in the event of a sale or a part sale, we'll look at a sale of a partnership. In the event of a sale of a partnership, it might be that the fair market value of the partnership does not equal the basis. Okay. In the case where I said that, you know, I was talking before where Bob sold his sold his partnership interest to somebody, well, Dave comes along and decides to pay uh, five thousand dollars for that partnership. Right. 
that would assume the fair market value of the entire partnership is $10,000 because Dave is purchasing the 50% interest for 5,000, okay? But maybe the basis is a little bit different. The actual, the actual basis is different, okay? And what happens then is you can make what's called a seven, section 754 election. This allows a step up in basis of assets within a partnership when there's a distribution of partnership, partnership property. That's the 734 that I said I would mention but not discuss too in depth. Or there's a transfer of interest by a partner, section 743B. Okay, that's what we're looking to look at right here. Section 743B increases the basis of property by excess of fair market value over the basis and creates a 743B capital account solely for the transferee partner. I have an example. Okay, my examples don't line up with what I'm talking. Um, so we'll go ahead and say, in this case, we have partnership ABC. A sells their one third interest. It's a 30%, it's a split three ways in third interest. A sells their one third interest in ABC to D for $100,000. So in this case, we have a partnership that has a fair market value of $100,000, okay? ABC has assets with a tax basis though of $180,000. So A's tax basis was 60,000, one third. So now D, their outside basis, what they paid for the partnership is $100,000. Again, going back to what we said, what we talked about in the first slide, basis. D's basis is $100,000 because they put in $100,000 to this partnership. But their inside basis, Going back to you know, the first slide again, talking about inside versus outside basis is $60,000. Could just let it go and let things, you know, you don't have to do anything necessarily, but a 740, 743B election or 754 election under section 743B allows the basis of the assets to be increased by $40,000 to bring those basis, you know, inside basis up to the same $100,000 as the outside basis. And that's allocated entirely to partner D. That does not affect anything for A or B. And of course, C is already gone. They've sold their interest. They've recognized gain or loss on their individual return. They've moved, they've, they've moved on with life, okay? So D gets an allocated that entire 743B adjustment. And that step up in basis is allocated among the various partnership assets. And it basically means, you know, if you have assets that are made up of 50% machinery, 50% land, 50% of that's going to get allocated to machinery, 50% to land. All right. And there's going to be special 743B depreciation over the course of the life of those assets to D only. Okay. So it's important to note that with 743B adjustment, it's only allocated to the partner that's acquiring an interest, in this case, through a sale. Going to move that one further back. Already to our third code word. There's going to be probably a large gap. Peter, you have a question while people are writing down their code words. What do you have? Um, what if all of the assets in the partnership are fully depreciated? Glenn, do you have any insight on this one? Uh, when I was doing something else, I missed the example. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was an issue where uh, there's a 743B adjustment allocated to various assets, but all the assets are fully depreciated. It, the, the 743B adjustment is depreciated over the life of whatever the asset would have been, correct? So the, so the, so the 743B base adjustment was allocated all to depreciable property and then fully depreciated? Well, the depreciable property was already depreciated. But the 743B assets have their own depreciation. Right, right. Life, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, so Peter, your 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 question there. Um, you know, there's a separate there's 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 a separate it, it becomes a separate asset. What I was saying is allocated is the value of that depreciate of that adjustment will be allocated commensurate to the proportion of non depreciable depreciable assets. Yeah, it's treated as a new asset acquired the date of the whatever the transaction that that the 743B basis adjustment arose in. Can I answer your question? You're typing. 
OK, great. All right, so hopefully we've gotten our third code word written down. Um, said there's going to be a big gap now because I thought I had spread these out a little bit more. Either that or I'm going way too fast and we're going to finish ahead of time. We'll fill in the time somehow. We've got enough to work. We've got enough to cover. Okay, in addition to this step up in basis, there is also a step down in basis um, that could occur. Um, there is an election to step down to step down in basis, or um, in certain circumstances, there is a mandatory step down in basis. Okay, and the, the mandatory step down in basis occurs when there's a significant difference, a substantially significant difference between basis and fair market value, all right? And in the, I can't remember the name of the act, but it was uh, enacted in 2004, um, one of the various uh, jobs acts in the beginning of the uh, 2004, um, that defined a substantial built-in loss of more than $250,000. So if there's more than $250,000 adjustment, then you have to make a mandatory step down in, base, in basis, okay? And similar to, the previous example where that step up in basis was allocated entirely to the contributing partner. If there's a case where you step down in basis, the same thing. It's going to be allocated entirely to the um, the acquiring partner, the transferee. Okay. I have not seen this. There was one instance maybe two or three years ago where um, I had to look into a, a situation where this occurred through inheritance, not through a, a purchase, but through inheritance. Um, but after working through you know, the information that was available, it was determined that the step down in basis would have only been about two hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, it, it didn't it didn't rise to the necessity of a mandatory step down. So that was only, that was my only experience or almost experience with this mandatory step down in basis. So I can't provide any, any examples in real life, um, but. It is out there and there is a threshold for it if, if it occurs. Okay, tax basis reporting. This was, well, it began, it was required for all tax years beginning on or after 1-1-2020. Um, it was initially required for tax years beginning on or after 1-1-2019, but Enough people complained that the IRS said, OK, we realize you're not going to be able to do this. We'll push it back a year. So last year, um, I know I saw a lot of these. Hopefully there's a lot that have been worked through, most if not all. Um, the, cap the, the capital accounts in a partnership on the Schedule M2, as well as the amounts reported on item L of the K1, are required to be reported in tax basis now. OK, whereas prior you could have tax basis, GAAP, 704B, um, other, I think there was just an other, you know, book basis. Um, the IRS is required that all of these be restated to tax basis. Now, it's important to note, even though we talked about earlier that debt will essentially give tax basis in turn, you know, for, for purposes of deducting losses, you know, 743B gives, out, gives an adjustment to basis. Tax basis for the purpose of M2 and K1 does not include those items, okay? So it's very important to note that those are not in there. So when we say tax basis, it's the IRS's definition of tax basis in the instructions for the schedule, or for the Form 1065 Schedule K1, okay? Fortunately, they did give a couple of methods for refiguring the beginning capital basis, or uh, you know, capital tax basis, the beginning tax basis, if other methods were used, okay? If a tax basis was used in the in, in the past, then you just move on with the reporting the tax basis, taking into account if you had included the 743B in there, or if somehow or for some reason you had put the uh, liabilities in there, you need to adjust those out. Okay. The modified previously taxed capital method. Okay. And I have these written down because they're forty. All right, so the amount to report as a partner's beginning capital account or the modified outside. I'm going to skip down to modify. Uh, we're on. Modified, yeah, sorry. The amount to report as a partner's capital under the modified previously taxed capital is equal to the amount of cash the partner would receive if you liquidated after selling all your assets in a fully tra taxable transaction 
increased by the amount of tax loss determined without taking into account any 743B basis adjustments and decreased by the amount of tax gain determined without taking into account any 743B basis adjustments. That's the modified previously taxed capital method. I do not have any examples of these, unfortunately. Um, but I believe if you go out there to some of the various research, you know, uh, BNA or Checkpoint or others, they probably have some good examples that you can follow. Um, the next method was modified outside basis method. The modified outside basis method is equal to the partner's adjusted tax basis and its partnership interest as determined under the provisions of subchapter K and subtracting from that basis, the partner's share of liabilities. So again, like I said, no liabilities and the sum of the partner's 743B adjustments. So basically whatever their tax basis is under Schedule K minus the two items that I said were not included, liabilities and 743B. Okay, and 704B, that's the book method, okay? 704B is equal to the partner's 704B capital account minus the partner's share of 704C built-in gain. That was what we talked about earlier when we had the difference in you know, the fair market value versus book basis, right? Plus the share of 704C built-in loss. So those are the three methods used to recalculate. You know, hopefully last year, a lot of the partnerships that we worked on got refigured. I know I saw a lot of K1s that came in that, you know, had footnotes and you have, and, 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 you know, I believe that you have to include a footnote or a statement in the K1 that describes why and how it was refigured. Um, you know, a lot of times we would just put a footnote in saying the IRS has required this adjustment and this reporting method. These are the adjustments that we made. You know, and you're, it, it's the beginning capital that's being refigured here. So, you know, a lot of times in 2020, well, 2021 for 2020 returns, I got a lot of K1s where the beginning capital account in the K1 did not tie to the previous ending capital in K1. And almost always, but not always, but almost always, there was a statement in there saying, showing the adjustments that were made. Um, so make sure as you're going through this year, working on any partnership returns, you know, if we're putting out any K1s, make sure you're looking at them. If they didn't get refigured last year, they're going to have to get it done this year. We may, you know, you may even have to go back and, and refigure last year's, but at least going forward, it should be done. So there is that. Any questions on tax basis reporting? Okay. Additional, I say new reporting requirements. It was new last year, but I'm still considering them new because last year was just one of those crazy years that everything was in a blender. So some things may not have gotten uh, implemented. Reporting net unrecognized 704C gain or loss. I talked about that earlier. There's a spot on the bottom of the K1 underneath the item L capital accounts to report that partner's share of unrecognized 704C gain or loss, uh, both beginning and ending balances. You also have to disclose if any aggregation was used for at-risk activity reporting. I don't think I saw any of that last year that I am aware of. If I did, I didn't pay any attention to it and I moved on. All right, again, not necessarily new, but something that's relatively new is the partnership audit rules. All right, this was enacted a couple of years ago where audits and assessments are at the partnership level rather than the partner level. OK. Um, I think it was 2017 or 18. This came into effect. And essentially any assessments, any any amount that may be due is assessed at the partnership level rather than going down to each of the individual partners. It becomes, becomes the partnership's responsibility to track down anybody they may need to claim anything from. Uh, there is an election to opt out of this. Mm, a lot of the partnerships that I work on um, were very small partnerships, one or two, three, eight people, 10 people. Um, I think I elected out on almost all of them. There are a few options or a few requirements though. There has to be fewer than 100 partners, no partner is a partnership, trust, or disregarded entity. So essentially, it has to be an individual or a corporation. I think there's a few other, maybe a few other um, things that qualify, partners that qualify, but by and large, you're looking for individuals and corporations, all right? 
you can have S corporation partners um, and, and locked out. However, the shareholders count towards the 100 partner limit. So if you have a partnership with 90 partners, all people, and then you've got a partner that's an S corporation and they have 20 shareholders, well, you've just pushed over to 110 partners for the purposes of these audit rules and you have you cannot you cannot elect out. All right. So any questions so far on partnerships? We're almost almost done with this section and moving on to S corporations. So do we have any any partnership questions at this point? They're doing a great job, or I've put you all to sleep. As long as you're getting your code words, hopefully you're good. Okay, Form 1065 and Schedule K-1. What is new for 2021, meaning tax year 2021, for tax filing season 2022? Schedules K-2 and K-3, I mentioned those briefly earlier. We're going to talk about them later on towards the end, but I want to let you, let you know that it, it is there, it is coming. We're going to talk about it later. But I want to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. S corporation. So now I'm moving out of the partnership world into the other type of flow through entity or pass through entity S corporations. In some regards, similar in the way that the income and expenses are passed through to the partnership to to, to the to the uh, individuals in this case shareholders, not partners. Um, but there are a number of different requirements in terms of eligibility, how to elect to be an S corporation, basis. Um, there are a few small differences in basis. Um, and then you have equity accounts that are different that don't exist in partnerships as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about a few advantages and disadvantages of S corporations, and that's advantages or disadvantages over a C corporation, not necessarily over a partnership, but between an S and a C corporation. So to be an S corporation, first off, you have to be a domestic corporation. It's in the middle of the slide there, but We'll just go ahead and start with that as the most basic requirement. Has to be a domestic, meaning US corporation. <clears throat> okay. 100 or fewer shareholders. All right. Eligible shareholders include individuals, US citizens, or residents only. Okay. You can't have foreign shareholders. Um, certain types of estates and certain types of trusts. Okay. As far as the trusts go, permitted trusts include voting trusts created primarily to exercise the voting power of the owned stock, testamentary trusts, grantor trusts, qualified subchapter S trusts, electing small business trusts, tax exempt retirement plan trusts under section 401. All right, that an example of that would be employee stock ownership plans, which uh, Quentin and his team talked about earlier today. So when it says qualified retirement plan trusts, that does not include any IRAs. You cannot have an IRA, you know, SEP, Simple, Roth, et cetera. You cannot have those as, as, as part or as shareholders. All right. And foreign trusts are not permitted either. Um, as far as the definitions of each of those trusts, I don't do any fiduciary work, so I would not be the person to ask. But just note that there are some, el some eligible trusts to be shareholders. OK. All right. Family members. When dealing with the 100 or fewer shareholders, it's not necessarily, and for purposes of shareholders, I'm primarily going to just talk about individuals. I'm not going to worry about the trusts and other potential entities. I'm talking about individuals just because it's easier. All right. It's not necessarily 100 or fewer individuals. Family members are considered one shareholder under the definitions of um, Regulation 1.1361-1. Okay. A common ancestor of all that ancestors lineal descendants, as well as the ancestors and descendants spouses and former spouses. Okay. That, in, that, that former spouses is actually interesting because one part of the regulation says that spouses being considered one shareholder terminates on dissolution of the marriage. But the very next section says spouses and former spouses are considered one shareholder. So interpret it how you will. Um, the the research that I was doing said that some, you know, some some CPAs take a more conservative approach, and if two spouses divorce, well, now you've got two shareholders. So if you're already at the limit of 100, you have to decide if one has to get out or not, or both. 
Okay. <clears throat> um, so you could theoretically have more than 100 actual individuals. You could have an S corporation with 150 individual people owning shares. But if all 75 of them are married couples, then you're at 75 shareholders. So just note that the family members are considered. Um, one key note is that descendants more than six generations removed are not considered family members anymore. But if you're getting six generations, that's that's pretty far down the line. So it doesn't come up too often where you're getting that far down. OK, and one of the requirement, there's a five year waiting period. If you had an S election that terminated either voluntarily or one of the eligibility requirements was violated and it automatically revokes to a C corporation, there's a five year waiting period to elect back to C to back to S status. So those are the basic eligibility requirements right there for an S corporation. All right. Tenants code word number four stock. Give you a second to write that down. And just one note on the eligibility requirements, even though for a lot of purposes, a corporation is considered an individual or a person, one of the, you know, somewhat hotly debated topic at times, you know, for the partnership audit regime that we talked about in partnerships, an individual or a corporation can be a shareholder or a partner and still elect out of the partnership audit regime. For S corporations, a C corporation cannot hold stock in an S corporation. It's not considered a person or an individual in that regard. So um, just note the difference in when, it's C, when, it, when a C corporation is considered an, a, you know, a person, so to speak, and not. All right, got this word written down. We're going to go ahead and move on to making the election for an S corporation. The election is filed on form 2553, okay? And it has to be timely filed in order to be a valid election. In order to be timely filed, there's a couple of different um, options or requirements. It can be filed at any time during the year prior to the year the election takes effect. So if you wanted the election to take place January 1st, 2022. You, know, you could file it any time during 2021 and say, you know, we will be making this the election to become an S corporation on 1-1-2022. OK. Or. It has to be filed on or before the 15th day of the third month of the effective year, which is essentially the due date for past the returns. OK. So if you want to make an election for 2022, the election has to be timely filed and made by March 15th, 2022. For a new corporation, the requirement is kind of the same. It's the 15th day of the third month of the corporation uh, following the corporation's activation date, the date they started business. OK, so if a corporation started on June 1st, you got July, August, September 15th is when you'd be due. All right, two and a half months, the 15th day of the third month or two and a half months after that date. Um, one interesting note is that if you have a corporation that has a calendar year, an S corporation with a calendar year that forms at the end of the year, you know, say they form the corporation on December 1st, 2021, all right, they still have two and a half months to make that election. Even though it passes into the next year, the time is never shorter than two and a half months. Very important to make sure, though, that timely filing because a non-timely filed S election is invalid and you could be filing a completely different return and operating under a totally wrong set of assumptions. There are uh, remedial methods if you make it an untimely filing. You can, you know, the IRS does allow for corrections, but it's easiest to get it done on time. Okay. Additionally, the corporation has to be in existence and operating. You can't file the S election before the corporation exists. Okay. Can't file it before the articles of incorporation are filed with the state, with the filing, with your, you know, for whatever state filing you have. All right. So important to make sure that you're really following, looking at the timing and when you're filing it. Also, requires the consent of shareholders. Okay. 
All shareholders on the date of the election must consent to the election. So if you can switch from a C corporation to an S corporation, all your all your shareholders have to agree to it. And if you're starting a new corporation from scratch and you're going to an S corporation, probably a lot easier than converting, but um, either way. Um, it's interesting to note that if anybody joins the partnership, the S corporation, sorry, the partner, the S corporation after that, now say you know, six months down the line, somebody decides to sell their interest in the S corporation to somebody else, the person coming in does not have to make consent to the S election. It's already been made. And effectively, they're consenting to the S corporation by purchasing into the corporate, you know, by entering the corporation. So it's only the the, the, the shareholders on the date of the election that have to, f to file consent. OK. Our old familiar topic of basis. We're talking about S corporations now and not partnerships. There are a lot of similarities between S corporation basis and partnership basis. Few difference, few differences. OK. Initial basis in an S corporation. Purchase cost of your shares. Again, if you buy your shares for $1,000, your basis is $1,000. Cash is the easiest way to look at that. Okay. Your basis, if you have a C corporation and you're converting to an S, your basis in the C corporation at the time of the, the conversion is now your basis in the S corporation. There's no change when the C becomes an S. Okay. If you acquire your S corporation through a gift, it's going to be the donor's basis. So if A, B, and C form A, B, and C S corporation and A gifts their, their, their shares to D, all right, whatever A's basis is, is now D's, D's basis. Inheritance, again, same with partnerships, is the fair market value at the date of death or the alternate valuation date. Debt basis. A debt basis in an S corporation is considerably different than in a partnership, right? In a partnership, we talked about how recourse, non-recourse liabilities, qualified non-recourse, all gave tax basis, okay? You can have debt basis in an S corporation, but the debt basis is only to a shareholder that the partnership owes. So essentially, a shareholder has made a loan to the partnership Partnership now owes that loan back to the partner. They have debt basis. So you don't have different classifications of debt. You don't have different qualifications. Um, you know, if you've got a loan on the books that was not made by a shareholder, you get a loan from a bank. That does not give debt basis to any shareholder. Right? It's only to a partner that has contributed or loaned, sorry, money to the S corporation. So considerably different there. All right. Adjustments to basis. Very similar to the adjustments to basis of the partnership. Additional contributions, distributions, taxable, non-taxable income, deductible, non-deductible expenses. That's fairly, fairly similar. Okay. In S corporations, there are well, there are four, potentially four separate equity accounts that you don't have in partnerships. Okay. Accumulated Adjustments Account, or AAA, Previously Taxed Income, PTI, Earnings and Profit, ENP, or other and other Adjustments Account, okay? Nope. I don't have a slide detailing each one. So other Adjustments Account, that's generally a measure of the corporation's accumulated gross income less expenses over the life of the corporation that have not been distributed to the to the shareholders. OK, it's not increased by tax exempt income and it's not decreased by expenses related to that tax exempt income. Important to note that basis is increased or decreased by non taxable income and non deductible expenses, but not triple A. OK, non taxable income and expenses related to that non taxable income that's going to go into your other adjustments account. So it's important to note that basis and accumulated adjustments are similar, but there is that one difference or not that one difference, but that's a major difference right there. Um, 
a good example of that this past year in 20, you know, for 2020 returns, PPP loans. You know, those the forgiveness of PPP loans essentially became tax exempt income. You know, so that would hit your other adjustments account. It would increase basis, but it would not increase AAA. Okay. Earnings and profit, we'll skip down to earnings and profit. All right, earnings and profit is only going to be present if the S corporation was a previously was previously a C corporation. All right. If you have a corporation that's formed initially as an S corporation, you're never going to have earnings and profit. An S corporation cannot have earnings and profit. Earnings and profit, if you have it, if you had a previous C, C corporation, all right, a key difference on the E and P versus the AAA. Accumulated adjustments accounts, distributions can be made to shareholders to the extent of AAA tax free. It's kind of like distributions. You know, if you have if you have basis, you can take a distribution tax free. If you've got earnings and profit that you have to distribute from, that's distributed as taxable dividends, exactly as it would have been if you were still a C corporation. Now, if you're a C corporation and you make distributions to shareholders, well, that's considered a dividend and is taxable. If you have E and P that carries over to an S corporation, then that's the same thing. You've got you've got to distribute it as taxable dividends. Previously taxed income, that is something you don't see very often. In fact, I've never seen it. I had to really I had to ask somebody what it was. Previously taxed income is um, undistributed S corporation income prior to 1982. So if you got really old S corporations, you may see that, but it is rare. And actually earnings and profit is fairly rare as well. Uh, a, lot of the a lot of the S corporations that I deal with which is not too many, but uh, most, I think actually all of them have, have been S corporations their entire existence. So I've never seen ENP either, but they, they could exist. ENP more often than PTI. And, uh, Okay, I went over that. Okay. All right. Um, advantages and disadvantages of S corporations over C, C corporations. A couple of advantages you avoid double taxation. Um, double tax taxation, meaning in a C corporation, the corporation pays tax and then they make dividend distributions to their. Shareholders, which are then taxed as well. You don't have that necessarily in an S corporation. You could have some taxation with the with the E and P, but you're still not going to be paying the entity level. Shareholder can deduct interest expense incurred to acquire the stock. Uh, you avoid the risk of accumulated earnings tax and distribute cash tax free to the extent of basis. Uh, disadvantages, as we'll talk about in a little while. Deduction of losses may be limited by basis, section 465 at risk or passive activity losses. All right, there's also the eligibility criteria. You know, if you violate that even by one, even on one day of the year, there's an automatic termination. So, um, you know, if during the year you accidentally add 101st shareholder, that violates the S election. So you have to be careful on that. An S corporation must use a calendar year. I mean, there are limited ex exceptions. The exceptions are very limited. By and large, if you have an S corporation, you have to have a January 1st through December 31st calendar year. All right, S corporations also potentially open up shareholders to alternative, min alternative minimum tax. Under the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, corporate AMT was, um, was, was eliminated. But if you have an S corporation, well, then but AMT is, you know, you could potentially have AMT at the shareholder level. So you got to be careful with that. Questions on S corporations. Being none. Okay. What's new for 2021? Schedules K2 and K3, I'm going to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. We are going to get to them, but 
we're not there quite yet. Tenants word five is shareholder. Give you a few seconds to write that down. All right. Where am I here? There I am. Okay. Pass through loss limitations. This is not necessarily consideration at the entity level. This is more of the partner or shareholder level, but it's important for there's a question whose hand is raised. Hold on. Glenn, yes. And so can you hear me? Yes. Uh, going back to S Corps for just a minute uh, sure. might be a good idea um, to point out a, a couple of other issues related to, to S Corps, such as the, uh, the built in games tax. Uh, if you have a uh, uh, an S corporation that was previously a C corporation. Um, and uh, elects to be an S corporation. The uh, to the extent that there are are built in gains at the time of the S election, like if the, the corporation owns appreciated property. Uh, if that property is disposed of within five years after the S corp election, there is a corporate level tax. On that, which is called the built in gains or, or big tax. Uh, another potential issue where you have uh, S corporations that are prior C corporations and have earnings and profits is what's sometimes called the, the sting tax or the, or the uh, tax on excess net passive income. So uh, an S corporation that has prior C corporation EP. If it has uh, basically all passive investments, interest, dividends, royalties, what have you like that, uh, it's subjected to a corporate level tax, which we call the sting tax. Uh, and it's subject to that tax. If, it, if it's subject to that tax for three years, it then loses its S corporation election. And uh, we've dealt with that. Uh, Couple of times. In fact, I had to get a, uh, a private letter ruling on one uh, client uh, that had an inadvertent uh, sting tax problem. Hmm. Uh, and then also, if you uh, if you want to touch on the uh, the ordering rules for distributions, so you mentioned the different categories of equity, you know, the accumulated adjustments account. And the right. prior, yeah. So, so, so distributions from an S corporation come first out of AAA, the accumulated adjustments account, then out of uh, uh, prior ENP, if there is any, then out of previously taxed income, and then out of the other adjustments account, and then out of basis. So, uh, and you can make an election uh, if you if if it's an S corporation with prior C corp earnings and profits, you can elect to have a distribution come out of E and P first uh, rather than triple A. And and if you wonder why you might want to do that is so you can get rid of your your E and P so you don't have to worry about the sting tax. So okay. uh, that yeah. all makes sense. Yes, yes. Thank you for the additional information. I don't deal too many with too much with S corporations, so it's good to get a little more insight. Okay. Thank you. Um, and what Glenn said did just remind me of one additional item that I did forget to mention in terms of ordering. Um, 
in terms of reduction in basis, uh, you know, adjustments to basis, um, it's important to note that distributions would actually reduce base basis before any non-deductible expenses or losses. All right. So it's important to note that when you're dealing with uh, uh, new partnership adjustment. To mute Glenn. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's important to note that when you when you when you're when you're when you're adjusting basis, distributions are going to be uh, are going to come first before any losses. So, and the reason for that is, or the the importance of that is, at least, you know, if you have a distribution that reduces your basis down to zero, and then you have losses as well, those losses are going to be limited. Okay, and that ties into the slide that we're looking at right now in terms of limitation. Okay. All right. So the three main hurdles to get to get across when you are dealing with pass through loss limitations. So if you get a K1, you know, if you, you know have a taxpayer has a K1 and it reports a taxable loss, you know, for simplicity purposes, we'll just say it has a $10,000 loss in box one ordinary income. Simple. Okay. There's a few hurdles to get across to make sure they can take that loss. The first one is basis limitation. Do they have any basis in the partnership or the S corporation. Okay. By and large, I have not seen too many issues with basis limitations, but occasionally it has come up. Um, there's, you know, you want to make sure you're tracking it to make sure you can, you can, uh, you know, take that, you know, have that basis. Next hurdle is section 465 at risk rules. Okay. Well, how can you have basis but not have at risk? Uh, one, 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 one good example going back to partnerships, you know, say you have no action, no, Say your basis, you contributed thousand dollars to your partnership, or you've used all that thousand dollars, but there's liabilities. Okay, you're allocated a portion of liabilities, so you have basis. But say all those liabilities that you've been allocated are um, non-recourse. Okay, non-recourse does not give at risk. If you have recourse debt, that would give you at risk. But if it's lot non, if it's non-recourse, you do not have anything at risk. All right, so you fail that one. OK, so now we've gone through basis. You've got basis. You've got at risk. Passive activity loss limitations. You are a passive partner in this partnership or S corporation. OK, you don't materially participate. That's considered passive, passive income, passive loss. All right. If you have no other passive income to offset it, all right, you can't take that loss. You can't get into a partnership for the sole purpose of generating losses to reduce taxable income. Okay, If you have no other taxable you know, if you have no other passive income, you can't take it. OK, so unfortunately, a lot of times that's where I've seen a lot of the limitations is passive activity loss limitations. Passive activity loss limitations do carry forward. You can eventually take them. Uh, you know, if, if, you know, if there's losses that are limited, you can take them going forward in the future if you have passive activity income or if you dispose of that activity. <clears throat> but if you fail all three of the of these, and unfortunately, that's it. It's suspended. But if you do pass all of those, say you have basis, you can take it, then you're good. You can, you can continue on. You can take that loss and move on. State considerations. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Amber and Mark did a really good job talking about two of these points here during their presentation earlier today, um, but I want to touch on a few of them at least. OK, the first st state consideration. This is not an entity or a, a pass through level consideration at all. This is the corporations, individuals, whatever. Do you need to file in that state? All right. That's the most basic question. Do you have nexus? Um, Amber did a good job talking about employees as we're coming out of the um, the pandemic, you know, a lot of states back in 2020 said extenuating circumstances. If you have an employee working in our state, we're not going to give you nexus. Well, now a lot of companies are saying we're going to just let people work from home or we're going to make people work from home. Um, you know, a lot of companies are just saying, don't come back to the office. We're not going to pay rent in the building. You can work from home and everything is fine. OK, but now you're now you're looking at employees in that state. So there's that sales. All right, especially with respect to sales of services. Not necessarily goods, but sales of services. A lot of states are going to what's called market based sourcing, which means that the sales of that service are taxed where the benefit is received. 
OK, so if you're if you're performing a service, say you're doing all the work in Virginia. Um, let's let's go back a few years. You're doing all the work for a service in Virginia and you're selling it to a customer in Tennessee. Up until just recently, both Tennessee and Virginia were already considered cost of performance states, OK? Which means that the, the sales were allocated or apportioned to or they're apportioned to the state where the most work was completed. In this case, it was in Virginia. I think last year or maybe in 2019, Tennessee became a market based state. So now if you have state sales to Tennessee, all right, you may have to pay an entity level tax in Tennessee. Tennessee is not a good example necessarily because it doesn't have an individual income tax, but it does have entity level taxes to an extent as well. All right, so you need to be careful about where you need to file. Non-resident withholding. A lot of states will require entities as corporation and partnerships to withhold tax for any non-resident partners or shareholders. Um, California is a good example of that. Um, Pennsylvania, I believe, as well. Um, so make sure you're 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 if you're filing in a state, make sure you're looking at those requirements for whether or not you need to actually file um, not, or withhold any taxes. Composite taxes. Composite taxes allow an entity to file and withhold taxes for their partners or shareholders at the entity level. Um, so with a, with a non-resident withholding, if it's just non-resident withholding, the partnership would, or S corporation, I'm going to say partnership for, for simplicity, would file in that state. They would withhold the tax and remit it. They would give the partner a state equivalent K-1 showing what their distributive share of income is, as well as any withholdings. The partner would then have to file in that, actually file in that state um, based on that, the information given on that. Um, now they may not want, they, they may not file if the in income is very small, they may just pass on it. But if they want to get that, you know, um, um, it may be that they can get, get it, maybe they can claim that withholding as a refund or as a credit. They could only do that if they filed in that state. A composite tax, all right, that allows a entity to file in a state on behalf of all of its partners and eliminates the need for a partner or shareholder to actually file in that state. Um, each state has different requirements on whether or not you can, or if you can, what criteria you have to meet. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that as it's more of a state issue, but it is a, um, you know, a consideration. Um, and entity level taxes, um, some states have, you know, entity level franchise fees, business privilege tax, what have you, and they call it different things. Um, you know, example, Tennessee, I think, has a $100 um, franchise fee, basically, for doing business in the state, you have to pay $100 to the state. There are a few others. I think Ohio has um, some various taxes that you may have to file as well. Um, they would put in their CAT. Um, sorry, David, what was the CAT? Commercial activity tax. Okay. Um, so there is that. So it's be be aware of any state uh, franchise fees that you have to pay. And also, Mark talked about earlier this new pass-through entity level tax election. This is an election made at the state level for the 19 or 20 states that have enacted this type of tax, where the entity level pays the income tax and then issues a credit to the shareholders or partners to offset so they don't have to pay any state taxes. The, you know, Mark talked about this earlier as far as a, um, you know, a way to circumvent the $10,000 state and local income tax limitation that um, has become an issue recently. Um, I have this IRS notice 2020-75. This has nothing to do specifically with that election. It's not a federal election. It's nothing that has to be done at the IRS level. This notice here, the IRS put out earlier this year, I think it was either this year or last year, 2020, so it might have been last year. Um, it basically states that further guidance will be forthcoming. However, at the current under current regulations, this this workaround for the SALT limitation is allowable, um, which was significant because previous to this, various states had tried to do various workarounds. Um, there was something a couple of years ago where states were trying to issue credits that would essentially offset the $10,000 state and local income tax limitation. The IRS put out some regulations that uh, that limited that. Um, 
So it's it's pretty significant that the IRS basically put out a notice saying that until further guidance is issued, we're okay with you doing this. So it's a way for you know anybody who's in a business to to circumvent the the ten thousand dollar limit potentially. Again, pending Build Back Better legislation um, that may or may not be relevant going forward. As far as whether or not Build Back Better will get passed in its current form, I highly doubt it. However, if you would like to hear more about that, Chris Brubaker is doing a rampant speculation session the last um, session of the day. So if you'd like to you know, go and listen to him ramble incoherently about his wild guesses about what the IRS or, the, or what Congress is going to do, um, that would be where you'd get information on that. So, but that's what you have as far as state considerations. Any questions on partnerships, S corporations, state considerations, limitations, et cetera, at this point? Um, we're going to start to move into looking at the K2, K3. So if there's anything that you have prior to that, I will answer your questions. David was typing and then stuck. So it was not important, I guess. OK, <clears throat> so I am going to. OK. Foreign reporting requirements, schedules K2 and K3. All right, schedule K2, partners, distributive, shares, items, international. This is a schedule that's attached to form 1065 or 1120S. Um, schedule K3, partner share of income, deductions, credits, et cetera, international, attached to schedule K1. I have here. So, this year, well, last year, this started to kind of get kicked around. The draft forms of these schedules, I think, were issued early to mid-2020, which is a very odd time to release new schedules when the entire world was, you know, locked in our houses, hiding from COVID. Um, I think there were another one or two drafts that came out this year, and the final forms, the final schedules, I believe, are um, are issued Final, with the exception of there is a section that I can't remember which section is not applicable for this year, so there'll be revisions, but essentially the final schedules are finally released. Unfortunately, aside from releasing the schedules K2 and K3 and the instructions. Here, all 32 pages of them, the IRS has released no other guidance on how to complete these schedules at all. If you Google schedules K2 and K3, you find the forms, the instructions, and a bunch of CPA blogs of people writing about, you know, blurbs of what they think they're going to have. Um, I think there's a tax advisor article that I read that was relatively useless. Um, so there's not much out there. But we will at least look at the schedules. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this, and I will bring up. Got. There we go. Okay. All right. Schedule K2, Partners Distributive Share International. Okay. So this is the schedule that gets attached to the entity level return, meaning the 1065 or the um, 1120S. This one that we're looking at, this is attached to Form 1065. The form for the 1120S is very similar. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and compare each one. We're just going to go over them and look at the highlights of each of each schedule. There's no no need necessarily to actually compare the, the schedules, especially when there's no information on them. Um, you know, at the top, you've got your basic the name of the partnership. EIN is the partnership withholding foreign partnership. Yes or no. Basically, this means is the is the partnership withholding any tax for any foreign partners? Um, and then down here, there are 12 parts to this schedule. And you would check yes or no, or your, your tax software ideally would check yes or no as to which sections you need to complete. All right, so there we go, section 12, reserve for future use. There was a section that wasn't applicable this year. Um, so section one, interestingly, is other. Usually when you see these kinds of schedules and forms, other is at the end, while other is at the beginning of this one. All right. It's interesting to note that in the instructions, pretty much all the all the information that's going to go into this bot, this part one other 
section. This is information that's not presented anywhere on this 19 page schedule. 19 pages and they couldn't even fit everything on there. That's how exciting this is. All right. If you have anything in here, you have to attach other forms, schedules, worksheets, statements, et cetera, to the to the schedule. So you have to attach attachments to the attachments. Gains on personal property sale, foreign oil and gas, splitter arrangements, foreign tax, high tax income, um, section 267A. Uh, a lot of these things here, um, they, if you would like some more information on what, what some of these items are, Faye and Carrie will be doing a foreign tax section, I believe, at the next session. So um, you know, I know so that I know they're going to talk about some of these and they'll also talk about these schedules as well. So you may get some information there that you don't get in here. And hopefully I present something that they don't and we we all learn something. OK, Form 5471, if you have to file a Form 5471, it has to be attached to the schedule. Other forms. This is the fun one. If you file any other form that's not listed anywhere on this schedule, you have to attach that form to the schedule. Examples include page here. Um, form 5713, International Boycott Report, 8833, Treaty-Based Return, 8621, 8865, that's a return of U.S. partner person with respect to foreign partnership. Um, Additionally, if you have a partnership that is subject to the interest expense limitation under Section 163J, you have to attach Form 8990. It's not a foreign form, but you have to attach 8990 and check that box for any foreign partners that are required to report their distributive share of excess business interest. So, all right, and a couple other items here. All right, part two, this is the information that would be most familiar to you in terms of the former line 16 on the schedule k1 for 1065s for partnerships all right this is going to be all your income deduction items that you that you would use to complete form 1116 or 1118 if you're a corporation and it's important to note that if you go through here not only do you have the source and type of information uh, you know the, the source and category of income you've also got the type sales services real estate rental income interest dividends, et cetera, et cetera, going on for 23, 24 lines. They even expect to add more. There's three lines reserved for future use. All right, if you're a corporation filing the Form 1118, all this information is relevant. You have to, each of these could be treated differently for corporations for the foreign tax credit. So all this information, if you're doing a corporation, you have to fill out and you got to enter in the uh, C corporation return. Fortunately for the 1116, for the individuals, uh, trusts, uh, I think it's uh, you know the returns that file the 1116. All you're going to need is line 24, the, the the totals, the summary. All right, the detail is not important for necessarily for the 1116. However, if you're if you're preparing an entity level return, and either you know that one of the shareholders or not shareholders or partners, sorry, is a corporation, or you don't know. Maybe you're filing a partnership return and you don't know where the ultimate taxpayer is. All right. You need to prepare all this information. All right. All this information has to be disclosed. You know, it, it may be that there's a partner or a partner that has. There's a partnership that has other shareholders, one of which is a corporation down the line. All right. They're going to need this information. So it's important that you if you if you know or if you're unsure that there's a corporation down the line. You may have to present all this information now when you're preparing the return. All right, then we get deductions again, category, US versus foreign, and all the different types of expenses. Same as same as the income. All right. If you if you all you have is individuals, you can just put in the summary. But if you if you have corporation or you have no idea, you're gonna have to present, excuse me, all this information. All right, part three, other information for the prepar preparation of forms 1116, 1118. Okay, um, you know, research, R&E &E expenses, apportionment factors. All right, interest expense apportionment factors, foreign derived intangible income. All right, that's a deduction for certain types of foreign derived income, which I believe might actually go away. I was reading something recently that being kicked around Congress that FDII may actually go away. So. The schedule may or probably will not, might not or probably will change in the future. 
but it's there for right now. <clears throat> yeah. All right, foreign taxes, foreign taxes continued, other tax information, All right? There's a lot on there. Deductions, eligible in income, qualified business asset investment. Um, again, same as what I talked about with the income and deductions back here. The, when you're preparing an entity level return, you only need to fill out the applicable sections. If the information doesn't apply, you don't need to fill it out. All right. So if you're doing a partnership, maybe it has a little bit of foreign activity somehow, but all you have are just two partners that live here in Charlottesville or, you know, somewhere local or in the state somewhere. You don't have all the information. You don't necessarily need to provide all this information. So you need to kind of look at this, read the instructions, unfortunately, because that's all we have at this point. Um, you know, read the instructions, see what may or may not be necessary to complete. So there's going to be a lot of a lot of lot of a lot of these a lot of these schedules when you get them or prepare them are probably going to be mostly empty because not all the information applies. It looks a lot on here, but um, may or may not apply. Distributions from foreign corporations to the partnership. Nine fifty section nine fifty one. Um, here we go. This is a big one right here. Okay, this is your passive foreign investment companies. Uh, this this is something you're going to see a lot when you get later in the year and you start seeing the big hedge fund return, uh, you know, K1s such as the the BlackRock or some other similar types of um, investment partnerships. All right. Last year, I got some BlackRock K1s for a, a, you know, a, a, a return that I was preparing. And there were 30 pages of PFIC information, passive foreign investment company information. And they were just on blank white paper statements as they always have been. And it was probably six or seven point font. I had to I had to expand the zoom on this PDF so far that I had to scroll forever just to see all the information. All right, then I got another K1. It was another it was another type of mutual fund. Uh, it looked great, but not all the information was there. It only gave half the information. So this right here, this is going to be ultimately once 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 things are going, you know, this will be very informative and helpful if you're preparing those types of returns where the you know you have a a taxpayer that has you know, a lot of investments in these PFIX. All the information is standardized. It's on this schedule right here. So it'll be a lot easier to prepare the return, hopefully, ideally. Um, so if if no other reason, I'm actually excited about this page um, for the schedule. Not excited about getting a K1 that has 20 extra pages attached to it, but um, or more. But at least the information may be there. And it may be more, maybe you're more useful in the future. All right, so we've got an additional sections here. Base erosion, anti-abuse tax, section 59A, um, foreign partner information. Well, I mean, a lot of this I don't even I've never even seen before, so I don't I, I can't really explain too much about it. I know Faye and Carrie will go over some of it uh, later on, so stay tuned for their uh, their session. And then we've got also bring it up here, right? That's the K2. That's the one that gets attached to the partner level or the partnership level um, return. This is the K3. So this is what you'll get attached to your K1. OK. Partnership and get your partner information, you know, same as you would. This, you know, this will all mirror what's on the face of the K1 checklist right here. The, did any of these parts apply? Yes, no. Right, and then you'll go down. And it looks very, very similar, if not identical, to the Schedule K2, except the only difference is this is going to be the partner's distributive share of income expenses versus the K2, which is the um, uh, partnership level or S corporation level. So um, aside from that, just scrolling through, everything is essentially the same. It's just paired down. All right, there we go. There's your, stop scrolling for a second. There we go. There's your PFIC information right there again. So again, because I have clients that have a lot of these hedge funds that have PFIX in them, I'm excited about that section. Please allow me to get excited about something this tax season. I'm hoping this will be a fun one or at least a good one. OK, so those are the two new schedules that we have. Go ahead and go back here. Current slide. OK, now in addition to providing absolutely no guidance on how to complete these, well, in lieu of providing no guidance, the IRS has released a notice. 
Notice 2021-39. The purpose of the notice is to announce transition relief for taxable years that begin in 2021 with respect to new schedules K2 and K3. Section 3 of this notice provides transition relief from these penalties for any incorrect or incomplete reporting. If the filer establishes to the satisfaction of the commissioner that it made a good faith effort to comply with the new reporting requirements. As long as you try, you're good. It, you know. so, it sounds like the IRS doesn't really even know what they want us to do, so they're just saying give it a shot and we'll let you know what we think and we'll provide future guidance later on. All right, 2021-39, that's the, that's the number of the notice. Um, that, that provides a penalty relief. It's about a you know, about a 10 page notice or so. Not much other information in there other than penalty relief. There's a little bit of information about the background of, of the schedules, but nothing in terms of you know how to actually you know, what to actually do. Foreign reporting continued. Not only do they not have any information on how to prepare it, there's delays in e-filing if you have to file the K2 and K3. OK, if you have a partnership now, this only applies to partnerships and S corporations with foreign reporting. If there's no foreign reporting, there is no change to e-filing. You can e-file on time as you normally would. But if you have foreign information, you have to attach Schedule K2 and K3 to a partnership. You cannot e-file until March 20th, which considering the e-file date, the deadline for a partnership is March 15th. I find comical and just bizarre. If you have an S corporation, you cannot e-file with foreign information until mid-June 2022. At least it's not five days after the due date, but it's still even more annoying. And if you have to file a form 8865, that's the um, uh, with respect to foreign foreign partnerships, you cannot e-file that until January of 2023. It's on the IRS website. I'm not making it up. I'm sorry. Um, the IRS website does say if you need to file prior to those dates, you can attach the schedules of the PDF attachment to the return, um, which is all well and good, but I don't know necessarily how you would attach the schedule K3 to each individual K1. If you've got a partnership with 500 partners, I don't know if you want to go through and attach K3 to each individual K1. That might get a little bit tedious and cumbersome, so you may just want to extend the return and wait until the e-file date and then proceed at that point. So that is that. Which brings us to our final code word of the day, which is foreign. I thought about using another word following that slide, but I thought I would be appropriate. Foreign is your final code word of the day. At this point, there are six minutes left. So if you have any questions, if anybody has any comments about anything that I've talked about, or if anybody has any information maybe about the K2 and K3 that I didn't present that I don't know about. Now would be the time to ask and or share that information so that we can get our full 100 minutes. David Harris is typing. Yes, exactly. So. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure why the uh, why they couldn't push this off one more year, but that is the case. Peter Brennan is typing. What does he have? Ah, Glenn, any other insights or information? You're usually full of interesting information. If you would like to impart any knowledge on us before we end for the day, that would be beneficial as well. Uh, well, if you want to back way up um, to the beginning of the of your export presentation, you, you, you touched on eligible shareholders, uh, including certain trusts. Uh, and so the, uh, but you didn't really, I don't think you went into any detail on them. So uh, basically the, uh, uh, a uh, grantor trust 
can be an S Corp shareholder. Uh, a, a, a qualified subchapter S trust, uh, also known as a QSST, can be a uh, can be a S Corp shareholder. An electing small business trust can be an S Corp shareholder. Uh, and a decedent's estate for a period of two years can be an S Corp shareholder. Now, uh, a qualified subchapter S trust is a trust that has only uh, basically qualified S Corp shareholders, individuals or estates uh, as beneficiaries, and that distributes all income to the beneficiary uh, on an annual basis. Uh, and that and that elects uh, to be a qualified subchapter S trust and a, and a qualified subchapter subchapter S trust is treated as a grantor trust with respect to the S corp stock, so it can actually be a part grantor trust and part taxable trust. Uh, an electing small business trust uh, is likewise a trust that has only S corp. Uh, eligible uh, beneficiaries. Um, and it actually, uh, with the electing small business trust, the trust itself, or I'm sorry, the, uh, well, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, the trust is taxed at the, uh, at the top rate for individuals uh, on its income rather than the income passing through to the beneficiaries. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else? Well, you got two minutes left now. <laughs> You're probably pretty close at this point. Any other? Any other questions, last minute questions, information, comments? Okay, well, if not, um, you know, hopefully as we go throughout the year, we'll get more information on the K2 and K3. Um, perhaps as I did with the 199A a couple of years ago, I'll start sending out a series of emails and might start numbering if they get high enough like I did before. I think with 199A, we got up to the double digits with a number of updated emails. So. Perhaps I'll do the same this year to oh, entertain wait, everybody with. Yep. Uh, one more point um, with regard to the distinction between partnerships and S corps. Uh, you mentioned the the differences in calculating basis and all, but also um, the S corp earnings that pass through to the to the shareholders are are not earnings for self employment tax purposes. If you have a partnership or an LLC uh, in which the uh, uh, the partner or member is an active participant in a trader business, the it income is. passing through is subject to self employment right. is self employment income. True. That's that's a, that's not, a very good distinction. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you touched on that. But no, anyway. I I neglected that. That's a, that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. That's quite important when I'm dealing with the individual return. So, all right. So we're at 240. Thank you all for your attendance today. Hopefully you learned something. Um, other than that, feel free to leave. And next session starts, I believe, in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 255.